Subcommittee will come to order. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, our subcommittee's first markup of the 116th Congress. Uh, we're meeting here today to consider H.R. 1644, the Save the Internet Act of 2019. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few announcements about today's markup. We will continue our committee practice of alternating between the Democratic and Republican sides for recognition of amendments, as well as giving priority to bipartisan amendments. We are continuing our committee's practice as announced in the notice of asking that amendments be submitted at least two hours in advance. This practice allows members to have a full opportunity to review and understand the amendments before debate begins. Uh, I will now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. So, as I said before, welcome to the Subcommittee on Communication and Technology's first markup of this new Congress. Uh, today, we will be marking up the Save the Net Act, which I introduced earlier this month and which has been co-sponsored by 163 of our colleagues here in the House. Uh, over the course of this debate, we have heard from consumer advocates, minority and underrepresented communities, rural broadband providers, small businesses, innovators, entrepreneurs, and millions of constituents, all calling for the restoration of these rules. Polls show that 83% of Americans of all stripes, whether they be Republicans, independents, or Democrats, strongly support net neutrality rules. So many people care deeply about a free and open internet because it is critical for so many communities and sectors of our economy. Today, broadband connectivity touches almost every aspect of our economy, politics, and culture. This is why I'm happy that today we are marking up Save the Internet Act. First, this legislation would restore popular bipartisan common sense net neutrality protections and put a cop back on the beat to protect consumers, small businesses, and competitors from unjust and unreasonable practices by internet service providers. Second, this bill gives the FCC the authority to protect consumers now and in the future through forward-looking regulatory authority. Third, the bill restores the Commission's legal authority to support broadband access and deployment programs through the Universal Service Fund. These programs play, pay for the deployment of broadband in rural communities throughout the Connect America Fund and support access to working families, seniors, and veterans through the Lifeline program. The Save the Internet Act would achieve these goals by codifying the FCC's 2015 Open Internet Order as a new freestanding section of law that would ensure the Internet remains an open platform for innovation and competition, regardless of political changes at the FCC. By codifying the order, this legislation also permanently prevents the FCC from applying 27 sections of the Communications Act, as well as over 700 regulations, the majority of Title II. In doing so, the bill permanently prohibits the FCC from engaging in rate setting, requiring that broadband providers unbundle their network, or levying additional taxes or fees on broadband access. The approach that we are discussing here today charts a new course for net neutrality and would put in place 21st century rules for a 21st century internet. This bill removes much of the regulatory overhang of Title II that internet service providers and our colleagues on the other side of the aisle have long complained about. The bill retains the Commission's ability to police unjust and unreasonable practices by ISPs. Opponents of this legislation need to ask themselves, what are the unjust and unreasonable practices that they want ISPs to be allowed to engage in? And why, we, why would we want to allow such practices? I have also encouraged my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to seriously consider this legislation, and I'm hopeful they will. This bill is a new approach and an open invitation to our colleagues and ISPs alike to come together and support a new way forward. This committee is known for its bipartisanship. At our recent hearing, I urged my colleagues to reach out if they were interested in working together. Uh, while I'm disheartened that neither I or my staff has had any outreach from my colleagues on the other side, uh, I, my door remains open and I wish to restate that if any members uh, wish to discuss this bill 
uh, between now and full committee markup. I hope they'll get in touch with us. We'll be happy uh, to sit with them and consider that. Together, we hope to advance this legislation through the Congress and restore these essential protections for all Americans. It's my hope that we conduct this markup in a civil and efficient manner. As all of you know, I'm not a fan of needlessly wasting time. And uh, with that, I will yield back my remaining 30 seconds, and I will introduce my friend and colleague, the ranking member, Mr. Latta, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And here we are at our subcommittee's first markup of the new Congress. Despite our requests and attempts to put forward a menu of options to work together on net neutrality, the majority has decided to push ahead on a partisan basis. It's a real missed opportunity. There are other potential solutions targeted at behavior we all agree consumers should be protected from. As I said at the last hearing, the idea that only Title II can be real net neutrality is dangerous and wrong. There are many other ways to approach this issue, including the three bills Republicans have introduced as starting points for discussion. Some of our colleagues have dismissed my own bill and those of Mr. Walden and Mrs. Rogers out of hand. I even read somewhere that the three Republican net neutrality bills were drafted by the ISPs. That would certainly come as a big surprise to the last Democratic chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Henry Waxman. My bill tracks his proposal from 2010 almost identically, and I don't think he considered it to be fake net neutrality, and I don't think that any ISPs were involved in drafting it at that time. Also, I think it would, be, it would come as a big surprise to the Democrats in the Washington State Legislature and Governor Inslee, a former member of this committee. Just about a year ago, he signed into law a net neutrality bill passed by an overwhelmingly bipartisan majority. The governor was widely celebrated by net neutrality fans at the time, so what has changed in the last year to cause a completely different reaction when the same thing was introduced by our colleague, Mrs. Rogers, a few weeks ago? Rarely has anyone moved a set of go posts quite so boldly, yet with so few people seeming to notice. The go posts have drastically shifted to complete government control of the internet. This innovative economic and social engine, which thrived for decades with little government input, will now be throttled by the heavy hand of Title II. There's a reason why Title II was a huge investment killer for small ISPs in the short time it was in effect. I highlighted at the last hearing some of the most troubling examples of the government's free-ranging authority to take over the, and micromanage privately owned broadband networks under Title II. My colleague, uh, Chairman Doyle, acknowledged that Title II does, not, does in fact carry all of that authority, but claimed that this bill would lock in permanent forbearance to keep the FCC from exercising much of it. It is not clear to me that this would actually be the effect of the bill's language, but even if it were, it appears that the FCC could easily accomplish all the same mischief through the broad authority granted in sections 201 and 202. So if you are a small rural broadband provider, there's still plenty to worry about here. We are all hearing concerns from the folks in this exact situation based on their thankfully short rural, real world experience with Title II. I hope some of my colleagues in the majority will be able to see past the false dilemma you are being presented with here. We stand ready to work with you, with anyone who is not completely wedded to Title II. I thank you, and with that, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize Mr. Pallone, Chairman of the Full Committee, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Doyle. And as you mentioned, today is the committee's first subcommittee markup of the 116th Congress, and I think it's fitting that that markup is on such an important topic as keeping the internet open and free. H.R. 1644, the Save the Internet Act, will return strong internet, strong net neutrality protections to the internet, which is so integral to modern American life. For over a decade, both Republican and Democratic Federal Communication Commissions have restricted the ability of internet service providers to control consumer access to the internet and undermine small businesses' abilities to compete. And that all changed in 2017 when the Trump FCC abandoned its regulatory role over the internet. No one was left to police cable and wireless companies to make sure they didn't abuse their power. The bill before us returns the FCC to its traditional oversight role and restores the net neutrality protections that both Democrats and Republicans demand. When the FCC decided to repeal net neutrality, it introduced terrible uncertainty into the market for ISPs, consumers, and small businesses alike. 
Back in New Jersey, I would hear from small businesses that their success depended on a free and open internet. I'd also hear from job seekers who relied on unfettered access to the internet in order to find the next job. And a free and open internet is crucial to strengthening our nation's economy and ensuring that everyone has access to a better future. It's about a marketplace of innovation, connection, and economic opportunity. This legislation restores the protections that 86% of Americans want and that millions of people demanded when the FCC made its ill-advised decision to strip away these protections two years ago. By codifying the FCC's 2015 Open Internet Order, we're reestablishing light touch regulations of the internet service providers. In addition to prohibiting blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization, the FCC will have the authority to stop future harmful practices that are unjust or unreasonable. And at the same time, the bill eliminates dated regulations and statutes that are not applicable to the modern internet. And this includes restricting the FCC from setting rates or requiring unbundling of networks. The Save the Internet Act locks in these rules of the road so that consumers and businesses will know now and into the future that the internet will remain free and open just, it was, just as it was when it began, with end users assured of full access to the internet. And failure to move forward on this legislation is simply not an option, in my opinion. Without this legislation, there's no backstop to make sure big corporations don't use their power to undermine and silence their small competitors or the political opposition. Without this bill, big corporations will have free reign, and when we talk about saving the internet, we're talking about what this country stands for. We're talking about saving the marketplace, and we're talking about saving our democracy. It's that important. That's how important it is, in my opinion. I, I have a, I don't know if anybody else wants my time. If not, I will uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank Gentleman you. Gentleman yields back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pallone. Uh, it's now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, uh, my friend Mr. Walden, for five minutes for an opening statement. Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, and congratulations on drawing the short straw and getting to hold the first markup in the subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee, the 116th Congress. Um, I'd just like to reiterate here at the beginning that I, too, remain committed to a bipartisan solution that can become law to preserve a free and open Internet. I believe it's achievable. I believe that for some time. I want to express to my friends on the other side of the aisle that our efforts to work together are genuine and they are presented in good faith. However, as the majority has decided to move forward with this legislation before us today, we will move forward with our due diligence. Members and the public need to fully understand the implications of the approach taken under this legislation, the scope of what it entails, and the impact that it could have on consumers. The net neutrality bright line rules are simple and relatively easy to understand. No blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization. That's what my bill would do. But despite whatever talking points you may have heard, Title II is not necessary to preserve a free and open internet, as has been proven before the Wheeler order and since uh, Ajit Pai removed the Wheeler order. In fact, quite the opposite. Title II could provide the federal government with near unlimited and unchecked authority for bureaucrats in Washington to oversee the internet. Today, we need to fully consider some of the potential legal and policy questions surrounding the actual effects of this legislation and of Title II. Does this bill empower the FCC to dictate where and when new broadband networks can or must be deployed? It's a real question. Will the bill provide the authority for a government takeover and management of private networks? That's a real question. Will the bill provide the authority for, for uh, the government taxation of the internet? It's a valid question. Could it lead to government regulation of speech on the internet? That too is a real question. Americans are more and more concerned about the role tech companies play in the information age. We read about how content gets blocked, prioritized, or shadow banned. We've had hearings on those issues before this committee. Our constituents are concerned about the impact of paid prioritization on their ability to compete online. We increasingly see their inability to curb harmful and illicit behavior, that of the edge providers, online. And while they monetize our personal information, meanwhile, they get special protection under Section 230 as if they were a common carrier, but they are not covered by the net neutrality rules they want to impose on everyone else that we're considering today. So what, if anything, does this bill do to protect consumers from those 
potential abuses and real abuses. So we need to get to the bottom of those questions and more today. And the fact is, we could permanently today vote for legislation to block, prevent blocking, throttling, and pay prioritization. This committee could agree to that, and it could be bipartisan, and it could become law, which should be our goal. We too believe in net neutrality, but net neutrality is not necessarily title to or not title to. Net neutrality does not need to be the harmful, heavy-handed approach that it is. All it needs, all we need for net neutrality is a Congress that's willing to work together where we can find common ground and a solution that can become law. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, good luck on your markup this morning, and uh, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank my friend. Uh, do other members wish to make opening statements? The chair recognizes Mr. McNerney for three minutes. Well, I thank the chairman for recognizing me, and I thank the chairman for introducing this simple and straightforward bill. Net neutrality fuels competition and innovation in our economy. It enables the internet to be an equalizer. It's essential for our democracy, and my constituents care very deeply about it. When the FCC moved to repeal net neutrality, over 8,000 of my constituents reached out to me in their opposition. I held a net neutrality town hall, a net neutrality town hall meeting in my district to discuss constituents' concerns. People came from all over my district. There were different ages, occupations, and backgrounds, but they all had one thing in common. They overwhelmingly wanted strong net neutrality protection. So let me go over some of the concerns that were raised. A veteran told me that he was worried about what net neutrality repeal would mean for his ability to receive telehealth services. A librarian expressed concerns about how this will impact the library's ability to provide digital skills training to people it serves on the internet in our community. Students expressed con their concerns about the ability to use the internet to do their homework and to apply for college. And a small business owner expressed concerns about what this would mean for her ability to grow her business. So I'm standing up for my constituents by being an original co-sponsor of Save the Internet Act. This legislation will restore meaningful net neutrality provisions that my constituents and Americans across the country on both sides of the aisle strongly support. It will ensure that the internet serves as a forum for the free, free flow of ideas and a gateway for economic opportunity. And this legislation will provide certainty, meaning that protections will exist regardless of changes in the administration or who is running the FCC. The bill does all this by taking an approach that's up to date, one that accounts for the internet of today and tomorrow without being overly burdensome. It revives the necessary provisions but stops the FCC from applying over 700 regulations to the ISPs, provisions that aren't essential to protecting a free and open internet. This is common sense legislation that, should be able, that we should all be able to get behind I think we owe it to our constituents to do that. I thank the chair for holding this at markup today, and I urge my colleagues to support this bill, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Gentleman yields back. Are there anyone else looking for opening statement? Mr. Shimkus, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is a great start. I do appreciate regular order, and I do believe that we should enshrine the uh, protection against no blocking, no throttling, and no trade prioritization into law. But I fear that we're missing a, a good opportunity to do that here today. For my constituents, this exercise isn't simply academic as to whether or not internet service providers could or would deceive consumers. In rural America, we need investments in modern broadband connectivity. And the fact of the matter is when private industry is considering making those long-term investments, the possibility that a future FCC could exert control over the services that company can, can offer and the prices it can charge has a chilling effect on commercial investments in broadband activities. We've had two witnesses offer testimony to the contrary. In one case, an ISP operated a substantially different business model than the rural providers in my, in my area. In terms of their focus on residential consumers, and the other, as our Republican leader noted at our last hearing, based his findings on decidedly incomplete information. To say the least, this has been a rhetoric-filled debate but the fact is we have tangled 
uh, we have tangible pressing issues to address, problems such as imprecise mapping and overbuilding in which government subsidies flow to areas that already have coverage are issues that we have struggled with for years. In fact, our former colleague, now Senator Kramer, and I worked on the most recent Farm Bill Conference Committee to make sure the FCC, the National Telecommunications Infrastructure Administration, and the Ag Department's Rural Utility Service are working together to coordinate our federal efforts at deploying rural broadband. So I'd rather be using this time um, not to move through questionable legislation with no pass of enactment, but rather to examine our existing broadband programs to ensure we're making the most of our scarce federal resources, ensuring they reach the places that need it most. This is critical in order, in order for my constituents to realize the promise of 5G, telehealth, telehealth, and 21st century educational opportunities. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time and I thank you. Gentleman yields back and I thank the gentleman. Uh, anyone else seeking? Uh, Ms. Clark is recognized for three minutes. Thank you. I want to thank Chairman Doyle for holding this important markup on, the, on safeguarding the free and open internet for all Americans. As Vice Chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee, I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor of H.R. 1644, the Save the Internet Act. We promised the American people net neutrality, and today this subcommittee is taking its next step its next step in the legislative process on delivering on that promise. It is imperative that we protect consumers from potentially abusive practices of internet service providers. When ISPs pick winners and losers, it doesn't just hurt consumers, it also chills competition and innovation. That's why our bill restores the 2015 Open Internet Order, which gave the FCC the ability to defend internet consumers and online competition. This includes preventing ISPs from blocking lawful services, throttling content, and pay prioritization. Consumers, not a small group of corporate insiders, should decide which websites succeed or fail. It also ensures there's a cop on the beat, the career staff of the FCC, with the authority to prevent anti-competitive and discriminatory practices. In addition, it reestablishes the FCC's mandate to support better broadband access for low-income Americans, those living in urban and rural areas. Internet access is no longer a luxury. It's a basic prerequisite for participating in the 21st century economy. These are not controversial ideas. An overwhelming majority of Americans support a free and open internet. But some of my colleagues will seek to paint this bill as partisan and even offer amendments meant to undermine this common sense legislation. Yet when Republican colleagues offered a CRA resolution to repeal net neutrality, they refused to use regular order and brought it straight to the floor. So it is fitting, just like the internet has facilitated transparency in our society, the net neutrality bill before us today is being marked up in an open and transparent hearing. This subcommittee will not fall for gimmicks, that let there be no doubt a vote against this bill is a vote against preventing ISPs from blocking or prioritizing content and enabling broadband access for those who need it most. The so-called Restoring Internet Freedom Order of 2017 does not restore freedom. It denies consumers the very thing it claims to protect. Our legislation restores real internet freedom and ensures consumers continue to enjoy and enjoy a free and open web. I look forward to working with my colleagues to pass the Save the Internet Act in this subcommittee, in the full committee, and ultimately on the House floor. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General Lady yields back, and I thank her. Uh, any opening statements? Uh, Mr. Johnson, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I find it disingenuous that we are here today to mark up the so-called Save the Internet Act which is actually a red herring designed to implement the misleading concept of net neutrality. The only saving the internet needs is from heavy-handed federal regulations. As Ronald Reagan famously stated, government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem. And that rings true today. Why is America the information technology leader of the world and why do we even have the internet today? We simply need to look at America's history. In the century after the Civil War, we healed ourselves from that bloody domestic conflict, fought two world wars, pushed back on communist expansion in Korea, and were deeply involved in the Vietnam conflict. 
Yet in spite of all that domestic and international conflict, America brought the world unimaginable innovations. The light bulb, the national energy grid, manufacturing processes that industrialized Western cultures, the airplane, space travel, landing a man on the moon, nuclear technologies, and medical marvels never dreamed of. But in the early 70s, big government regulators multiplied and began pouring water on our innovative campfire. Washington began telling the American people not only what to innovate, but when, where, why, and how. The exception was information technology, the one industry government couldn't figure out how to regulate. And it's the segment with the most growth and innovation today. From 1996 to 2015, the internet was thriving. It grew at a rapid, unprecedented pace and enabled countless innovative technologies that Americans have come to rely on. Connectivity for businesses, students to do their schoolwork, families and friends staying connected, telemedicine, and other everyday conveniences. However, it was under the big government grab of then FCC Chairman Wheeler and the declassification of broadband as a utility-style telecommunications service under Title II that we saw a decline in broadband deployment and online innovation and investment. This is a serious issue, particularly for geographically challenging and rural areas such as eastern and southeastern Ohio that already struggle with broadband deployment. The digital divide is very real, and we have a responsibility to provide solutions, not create additional barriers to deployment, continued growth, and innovation. What's more, there is bipartisan agreement to prohibit blocking, throttling, and anti-competitive conduct. However, legislation to actually accomplish these objectives were intentionally left out of this markup. If the majority were truly in favor of so-called net neutrality, of ensuring an open and vital internet, and preventing network operator interference, they would be willing to work across the aisle and consider these ideas. Mr. Chairman, I urge the committee to rethink this. The strength of our nation is not in big government. It's in the indomitable spirit, the heartbeat of the American people. That's where innovative innovation was born. That's where it lives today. I urge you to reconsider this markup. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, any opening statements? Uh, the, who's next? Who's next? The general lady from uh, California, Ms. Eshoo. I'll get you next. I thank the chairman for recognizing me and for uh, <clears throat> today's markup, uh, the first markup of this uh, uh, subcommittee in the 116th Congress. So do. Uh, I, I think that we need to um, look over our shoulders and reappreciate um, what the internet uh, has represented and continues to. Uh, it's one of the most powerful networks, if not the most powerful network in human history. Uh, it's enabled previously unimaginable services uh, and unfettered access to full libraries full of knowledge. It's stunning what, the, uh, what we uh, access on the internet. And this is an American innovation. And it's taken place over really a very short period of time. It's only been uh, really a, a few decades uh, because entrepreneurs were able to get their websites and their apps in the hands of users without paying additional fees to ensure that traffic is delivered at the same speeds as the websites and apps of larger competitors. We need to appreciate that. Now, some have said that the internet developed without net neutrality regulations. So why shouldn't Congress just let it be? The original internet architecture led to a de facto net neutrality regime because to do otherwise was technically challenging, if not impossible. The technical underpinning of the original design of the internet meant that all data packets were treated the same. So what happened? What happened? Over time, ISPs developed sophisticated capabilities to discriminate traffic because they knew they could corner some companies into paying for access to users. Profit motives overpowered fairness principles, and examples of ISPs abusing net neutrality in the last decade are, at this point, countless. And this dynamic is really worsened by the fact that four out of 10 Americans have, at most, at most, 
one choice of broadband provider. So these numbers, and these numbers are starker for higher speed connections. So if someone doesn't like the practices of their ISP, they have no other alternative. It is more than fitting that this bill be taken up and passed by Congress. It's sensible. Uh, it reflects uh, all of the items that, the, uh, that our Republican colleagues have said they are opposed to, uh, blocking, throttling, paid prioritization. Uh, I don't need to go through all of them again, but I think that it's worth mentioning them. Uh, and I think that it is very important because the Republicans have continually said, you want to regulate this like it's a utility, blah, 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 that there is forbearance on that. There is forbearance on it. Uh, I, I would just uh, pose uh, uh, the, the, the question uh, that, uh, that the chairman uh, did. I don't understand the procedural roadblock to, to this simple idea, because Mr. Doyle's bill prohibits unjust and unreasonable discrimination. So who's against unjust and unreasonable discrimination? Yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Who seeks rec rec uh, My good friend, Mr. Scalise, is recognized for three minutes. I thank my friend and the chairman for yielding, for having this hearing today. Um, Mr. Chairman, everybody here today can agree that the Internet's made immeasurable impacts on our lives in a positive way over the last few decades. That's why we're here today, because the Internet and the technology policy behind it really does matter. Unfortunately, today's proposal takes us down the wrong path. When I was in school, majoring in computer science, when I would do my homework, we actually had textbooks back then. Uh, and when I had to write a program, I'd have to go to a computer lab, and there would be a computer maybe about half the size of this room that I would have to wait sometimes hours to get the results for when I'd run a program. Today, this device has more technological capabilities and power uh, than that big room that needed an air condition unit just to keep uh, the, uh, the computer cooled. And I say that to make it very clear. That change, that dramatic shift in technological capabilities happened with billions of dollars of private investment. When we went to 2G, 3G technology, then 4G technology, now we're working towards 5G technology. That's the private sector investing billions of dollars to continue to have a free internet. It's free today, by the way. Today the internet's free without the government being involved. But the digital transformation that's happened is precisely because the heavy hand of the federal government has stayed out of the way. Uh, this happened because the government hadn't figured out how to regulate the internet, so it's allowed this great technological capability that's created the United States as the world leader. We dominate the world in technology without this heavy hand of government approach that you see today. I'm disappointed that we're con considering this proposal which like so many other things, like the Green New Deal and all these other uh, plans to have more government control of our everyday lives. This today is about government control versus individual freedom. The legislation is a dangerous power shift towards bureaucrats in Washington. It will raise costs for consumers and hamper future innovations online. Under this big brother heavy-handed approach to regulating the internet, the Federal Communications Commission an unelected group of bureaucrats would have nearly unlimited authority to micromanage the internet, and that includes raising new fees and taxes on the internet. Again, government can tax the internet under this bill, which is currently free. What, I ask you, is so broken about the internet that you need the federal government to come in and fix it? We simply do not need the federal government to come in and fix what is not broken with a free and open internet that we enjoy today without government regulation. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back, I thank him. Uh, who seeks rec recognition? Mr. Soto, recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you for presenting a strong, comprehensive net neutrality protection bill. Uh, my office has been inundated by phone calls, emails, Twitter, you name it, in support, uh, and 
Obviously, I've heard from quite a few of my constituents uh, in the matter of some of the issues that have come up in this hearing. First, uh, it's clear that this bill gives the FCC great oversight only to unjust, unreasonable, and discriminatory practices, which is more than just throttling, blocking, and paid prioritization, but it does not give the FCC power to broadly set rates or to direct investment under this bill, uh, which is something we've heard a lot about already. In addition, elaborating on some of the comments that were made on 201 and 202 edge providers, uh, this bill provides that the FCC will have authority to examine interconnection agreements between ISPs and entities looking to interconnect with their networks, including edge providers. Uh, though only ISPs can be held to unjust, unreasonable, and non-discriminatory pro prohibi prohibitions under 201 and 202, by giving the FCC the, FCC the authority to take a look on a case-by-case -case basis when disputes arise, the standard will be viewed against the actions of other entities, such as ed edge providers. So in effect, the actions of all parties will be evaluated. These were concerns that were brought to us, and I believe that we should continue looking at them. Uh, in future regular order, in bills, and in uh, other ideas that may come forward. But that shouldn't stop us from moving forward on this bill today. Uh, these are issues that we can continue working with our colleagues across the aisle and our colleagues in the Senate. So I thank you for this hearing and for this bill and look forward to continuing to work with everyone. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition on the Republican side? Mr. Gianforti, uh, three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the internet is a lifeline of our rural communities. It contributes to these rural communities by enabling high tech in agriculture, education, healthcare, and telecommuting. Yet two out of five Montanans in our rural areas lack access to broadband. Unfortunately, I haven't heard how the Title II regulatory approach in which the in internet is treated like a rotary phone from 80 years ago will increase broadband investment in our rural communities. At our last hearing, I said I thought all members of this committee support opening the doors of opportunity to Americans in our rural communities. Perhaps I was wrong. Even after members on our side of the aisle committed to working on legislation that would codify the bright line rules, here we are a month later marking up a bill that doesn't offer a solution. This bill just takes us back to the same tired discussion while millions of rural Americans remain unconnected and underserved. What's worse is now this bill already has a date set for its consideration on the House floor before it's even left our committee. This process has been predetermined from the beginning and is a partisan politics at its worst. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. O'Halloran for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As some of my colleagues have mentioned here today, Americans are counting on Congress to finally provide stability to the rules of the internet. And I hope that uh, it is a goal we can achieve by working together. The internet of this bill echoes the sentiment that in today's world, consumers should not be subjected to anti-competitive throttling or blocking on the internet. And we can all agree that a free and open internet is not one where winners and losers are predetermined, but where innovation and entrepreneurship can continue to flourish. What was once described as net freedom in the FCC's 2005 internet policy statement has brought us to where we are today in considering H.R. 1644, the Save the Internet Act. The Save the Internet Act must in ensure consumers, especially those in rural America, have continued access to the internet, which has proven so critical to allowing families and communities to thrive and rejoice in the technology of today and tomorrow. Paramount within H.R. 1644 is the enforcement rule role of the FCC. In this legislation, Section 2B of the Save the Internet Act codifies certain forbearances within the Communications Act. 
Ensuring that these bright line consumer protection rules are enforced is critical. And just as important is the FCC con conduct it, it, if enforcement authority in the manner Congress so prescribes. We have seen net neutrality debated in the courts, in the halls of Congress, and in town halls across America over the years. It is this committee's duty to ensure that net neutrality protections ingrained into law are sustainable, enforceable, and hopefully bipartisan. After this committee considers the issue of net neutrality, I look forward to working with my colleagues on legislation to address net disparity, the lack of internet access in rural America. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, any members of the Republican side seek recognition? If not, are there any members on the Democratic side seeking recognition? Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Butterfield for three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in lieu of an opening statement, may I engage you very briefly on a colloquy? Will the gentleman yield? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for your work on this issue. I know you've worked very hard to, to bring this bill to the committee today, and I just want to thank you for, for your work. Uh, I have talked with you and talked with your staff back and forth over the last few weeks, and you have been nothing less than cooperative, and I thank you so very much. As I've told you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for too long there has been uh, a back and forth between Democratic and Republican administrations at the FCC. Uh, this is my 11th year on this committee, and I've just seen it from the pre-Wheeler days to the post-Wheeler days, and we've been back and forth. And, and I think it's now it's time for this Congress to act. Uh, Chairman Doyle, you have described your bill as locking in, quote, unquote, and the forbearances contained in, in the 2015 order, including eliminating 700 outdated regulations, and that is good. These forbearances are important to providing regulatory certainty and spurring innovation and investment. The stakeholders for sure need certainty. I would like to clarify, Mr. Chairman, uh, that the FCC's 2015 forbearances are indeed permanent under the legislation before us and would ask you, sir, to explain how this bill prevents a future FCC from seeking to reverse that which was foreborn under the 2015 order. I yield to the chairman. Thank you for yielding, and thank you for your question, Mr. Butterfield. You yes. raised an important point, and we discussed it at our legislative hearing two weeks ago, uh, but I think it bears repeating. The Save the Internet Act says that Congress restores, as an effect, on January 19, 2017, the entire 2015 Open Internet Order. That includes the forbearances. An agency like the FCC may not act contrary to the law or the unambiguously expressed intent of Congress. The Save the Internet Act is direct, unambiguous, and to the point. The bill would restore the FCC's 2015 order in its entirety, and it specifically cites the order on forbearance. The bill, first, restores the report and order on remand, second, the declaratory, the declaratory ruling, and third, the order. That third order is the order on forbearance. By specifying that date, the Save the Internet Act would ensure that anything that was applied or was not applied would be frozen as it was on January 19th, 2017. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Chairman. I think it's important that uh, those, uh, that statement be included in the official record. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Does anyone else seek recognition? Mr. Welsh, you're recognized for three minutes. Uh, thank you. I just uh, ask for, uh, permission to introduce into the record a letter in support of net neutrality protections encompassed in this bill signed by four governors, including the Republican governor of Vermont, Phil Scott. Thank you. Uh, without objection, uh, Mr. Welch's and Mr. Butterfield's statement will be entered into the record. So moved. I believe... That concludes uh, our opening statements. Pursuant to the committee rules, uh, all members' written opening statements shall be made part of the record. Uh, please submit any written opening statements to the clerk's desk. Uh, we will now begin consideration of the bill. The chair calls up H.R. 1644, the Save the Internet Act of 2019, and the clerk will report the title of the bill.
1644, a bill to restore the open internet order of the Federal Communications Commission. Without objection. Reserving the right to object, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman reserves the right to object. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now considered as read. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman seek to be recognized? Uh, on my reservation, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman will proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, obviously, Republicans have concerns about uh, the scope of this bill, what it does and does not do. So we will have questions for counsel uh, regarding how the bill will operate if enacted into law. Um, and I hope the majority doesn't find our questions too troublesome, but they're important. And uh, so I just want to make clear we will have uh, questions for counsel, which is usual and proper, and I assume that will be appropriate uh, yes. under your rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I withdraw my objection. Thank you. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Are there any bipartisan Mr. amendments to the bill? Uh, the general lady? Strike the last word. General lady's recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Skillies had, had um, said several times in his opening statement definitively that this bill uh, taxed the internet. So I just have a question for counsel um, asking them, um, do you find any provisions in this legislation that, that taxes the internet? Congresswoman, Paragraph 430 of the order reads, quote, the Internet Tax Freedom Act prohibits states and localities from imposing taxes on Internet access. This pro prohibition applies notwithstanding the FCC's regulatory classification and broadband Internet access service. Uh, subsequently, the Internet Tax Freedom Act was made permanent in 2016. Additionally, in paragraph 488, the FCC forbears from the first sentence of section 254D and the FCC's associated rules insofar as they would immediately require new universal service contributions associated with broadband internet access service. And in paragraph 432, the FCC also makes clear that the states are bound by its forbearance decisions under section 10E of the Communications Act. A state commission may not continue to apply or enforce any provision from which the commission has granted forbearance. So, counsel, what you're saying, in fact, is it's the opposite of what Mr. Scully says, th this bill says we will not tax the internet. Is that correct? Congresswoman, the Internet Tax Freedom Act would still apply uh, okay. regardless, and any mandatory contributions that might otherwise be conceived as taxes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Uh, are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Mr. Chairman, reserving, uh, uh, I move what strike. What purpose the does the gentleman seek to be recognized? I, I move strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I want to pursue this issue because I think it's important going forward. Um, since 1998, the federal law has prohibited federal, state, and local governments from taxing the Internet. But H.R. 1644, we believe, creates a new avenue for government at every level to do so by reclassifying broadband as telecommunication services. This is because the Universal Service Fund, which is overseen by the FCC, is only collected on telecommunication services, in other words, voice communications. It is not collected on information services like your home internet or data use on your mobile phone. By reinstating the 2015 Open Internet Order, H.R. 1644 would reclassify the internet as a telecommunication service that the government could impose fees upon. Now, the Wheeler FCC only exercise, and I quote, limited forbearance here, and one must wonder if that is to leave a window open to assess broadband fees later on. As we heard from one member of this committee on the other side during the subcommittee hearing, the majority believes this bill will ensure that, and I quote, access to internet services remain open and not dependent on one's ability to pay. Now, to me, that sounds like this bill would lead to a tax on the internet to fund a universal uh, broadband service for all. So you've cited the order, but tell me in the bill, Council, um, the provision that precludes the FCC from taxing the Internet going forward, because we believe under Section 201 and Section 202 that are still alive, and other provisions, while you're locking, while this bill would lock in the forbearance, it does not preclude the FCC from going forward with other regulatory schemes. Isn't that correct? Congressman, under Section 2B1 of the bill, uh, the bill would lock in the report and order on remand, the declaratory ruling, and the order on forbearance. So the forbe forbearance is made under Section 254D of the Act would uh, still apply. But does that, Council, does that language actually say they can never go forward? 
Where does it say that? Because it says it puts uh, the report and order on demand declaration really in order in the matter of protecting and promoting the open internet that was adopted by the commission. These are restored, but I don't see where it says, and the commission can not uh, do further rulemakings on this section. Congressman, here uh, Congress would be explicitly restoring the order on forbearance and under administrative law when Congress is expressly and precisely restoring it as a date in a date certain, the FCC would lack discretion to revisit that expression by Congress. So let me ask you a question, Council. Could the FCC uh, move forward on rulemakings in this space under Section 201 and Section 202? Is there anything that could you cite in this bill where Section 201 authorities and 202 authorities are, are pre, the FCC is precluded from doing rulemakings on anything related to 201 or 202? Congressman, in the order, the FCC foreborn from the rate making regulations associated with sections 201, 202, and associated, and the provisions themselves to the extent they could be used for rate setting. Right, but what about other provisions? Is there anything in this bill that precludes the FCC from moving forward on 201 and 202, its necessary cousin, to quote a prior witness, Mr. McDowell, um, to do all kinds of, of rule makings that were not part of the Title II uh, regime that Mr. Wheeler put in place. Where in the bill are they shut down on 201 and 202? Congressman, the, the bill would lock in the forbearances related to the rate making provisions and, and so, rate setting. So you're telling me this bill prevents the FCC from taking any regulatory actions under 201 and 202 going forward? No, Congressman. Okay, that was my question. So you, you lock in under the forbearance piece, you restore the forbearance, this bill, not you, I'm sorry, but this bill would restore the forbearance, uh, some 700 of them, right, under Title II, um, as of the date cited here. Um, now, the, the question, um, do, do you believe that, does this bill, I won't ask you what you believe, does this bill prevent uh, states and localities from taking actions under any of the provisions? Congressman, under, uh Paragraph 432, the FCC makes clear that uh, the states are bound by our forbearance decisions today. Under Section 10E, quote, a state commission may not continue to apply or enforce any provision from which the commission has granted forbearance. All right, let me move on to uh, a different topic. Going back to the 2015 order, I've repeatedly expressed concerns about the lack of parity between ISPs and EDGE providers on the net neutrality discussion. Um, so at the hearing, I was interested um, about some of the comments that were made. Do you believe, and, and I think Mr. Soto raised a question earlier today about uh, interoperability and the link that provides to EDGE providers, perhaps through the memoranda of understanding that is, is there at the Commission. Do you believe that the provisions under this bill could, through interoperability, or I should say within this bill, where, where is it precluded that EDGE providers uh, would, would not fall under the, the, the rules that we're talking about today if they're connected through interoperability and MO, uh, memorandum of understanding? Congressman, the 2015 order defined broadband internet access service to include the exchange of internet traffic by an EDGE provider or an interme intermediary with the broadband provider's network. The underlying obligations under Section 201 and 202, however, applied to that exchange of internet traffic fall on the broadband internet access service provider and not the edge provider. Gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman seek to be recognized? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to strike the last word on the bill. This gentleman's recognized. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I'm also looking to clarify some areas about the Commission's authority under Title II and the scope of the forbearance that was granted in the 2015 order. And to what extent uh, any of that forbearance can be made permanent by this bill. It is also important to note that the Commission in 2015 did not forbear from applying most of Sections 201 and 202, which convey the broadest authority in all of Title II. So if I uh, may, I'd like to ask a few questions for counsel. Uh, regarding the scope of uh, Section uh, 201, the Commission did not forbear from applying most of Section 201 or 202 of the Telecommunications Act 
under the 2015 open internet order. Is that correct? Congressman, the commission only forbore from sections 201 and 202 to the extent it could be used to set the rates of broadband internet access service providers. All right. Section 201 states all charges, practices, classifications, and regulations for and in connection with such communication service shall be just and reasonable. Is that correct? Yes, Congressman. Thank you. Section 201 further states the commission may prescribe such rules and regulations as may be necessary in the public interest to carry out the provisions of this chapter. Is that correct? Yes, Congressman. Thank you. Section 202 states, it shall be unlawful for any common carrier to make any unjust or unreasonable discrimination in charges, practices, classifications, regulations, facilities, or services for or in connection with like communication service. Is that correct? Among other things, yes, Congressman. Okay. When you say uh, m among other things, how do you mean by that? Uh, the, the section goes on. That's the uh, first clause of Section 202A. Okay. Uh, it right. goes on. There's section okay. Thank you. For purposes of the general authorities provided under Section 201 and 202, is just and reasonable defined in the Act, or is the determination of just and reasonable left to the interpretation of the Commission? Congressman, the Communications Act does not define unjust and unreasonableness, but the Commission would be bound by the normal Administrative Procedures Act and the processes they would have to follow in making a determination of what those uh, but, but terms But it's not are. defined by statute. It would be up to the Commission. That's correct. Thank you. <clears throat> so <clears throat> so uh, just to follow up on that, so the authority of the Commission here is quite open-ended. Congressman, the Commission's authority under sections 201 and 202B to d define those terms would be that they would have to follow the normal Administrative Procedure Act requirements for interpreting a statute. Okay, uh, let's, and going to uh, the codifying on the forbearance, uh, can you please cite which provision of the bill expressly prohibits the FCC from applying the 700 plus rules from which the FCC said it granted forbearance as part of its 2015 open internet order? Section 2B1. Okay, let me ask, uh, let me follow up. Can you please cite which provision in the bill requires the FCC not to modify the forbearance from certain FCC rules granted in 2015 report and order? I'm sorry, Congressman, could you please re yep. repeat the question? Would you please cite which provision in the bill requires the FCC not to modify the forbearance from certain FCC rules granted in the 2015 report and order? Section 2B1. Of the 700 provisions the 2015 order stated it was forbearing from, could the FCC use its authority under Section 201 or 202 to enforce any of the provisions by determining some particular conduct not to be just and reasonable. Congressman, nothing in the legislation would stop the FCC from acting to address instances that were deemed pursuant to its procedures to be unjust and unreasonable. Okay, so that, so again, uh, going back to a previous question, so that would be um, leaving that rather open for the, let's uh, say, a uh, future commission to act, that they would have that uh, uh, particular uh, conduct not to be, uh, you know, not to be said it was just and reasonable then. So they could move forward on that then. Subject to the Administrative Procedures Act and the Supreme Court's precedent interpreting it. All right. Thank you very much. No, I have no further questions. We'll Gentleman move. yields back. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I move the strike last Mr. word. Mr. Chairman. Uh, the chairman is going to move the strike the last word. Uh, I just want to remind my colleagues that the Commission has long recognized that Sections 201 and 202 lie at the heart of consumer protection under the Act and are the bedrock consumer protection obligations under the Communications Act. These time-tested uh, time provisions were applied by Congress to the wireless service, and that industry has thrived. Why should broadband Internet access, the communication service of the future, be treated any differently. Uh, with that, I yield back.
For what purpose does the gentleman seek to be recognized? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To strike the last word. The gentleman's recognized uh, for five minutes to strike the last Thank you. Word. And if I may ask a question to counsel uh, before I yield my time. Um, I'm looking up the word forbearance because uh, I'm not a lawyer, so it's obvious it's a, a major part of this um, hearing. And in the definition, it really talks about finances and, and mortgages and stuff. But the term falls upon the word, it says it means holding back. Is that what you, your definition of forbearance is? The definition for forbearance uh, for purposes of this discussion, I think would be uh, in the context that it's used in section 201, oh, excuse me, it's the wrong section, in section 10 of the Communications Act, uh, where it says, Notwithstanding Section 332C1A of this Act, the Commission shall forbear from applying any regulation or any provision of this Act to a telecommunications carrier or a telecommunications service or a class of telecommunications carriers or telecommunications service in any or some of their geographic markets if the Commission determines, and then there are three factors. Okay, well, let me stop there. I appreciate that. So uh, does the word forbear mean hold back? Congressman, I don't believe there's a specific definition that is cited to. Okay, then let me ask this question. Um, uh, is there a way to say in perpetuity, like forever? Because in this definition, it's, a, it, you know, it, it's referring to a lender and a borrower, a guy not paying his mortgage payment. They forbear the rate, but in the end, they have to make the payment. So if that definition is the same in this line of, of, of questioning, uh, I think that might leave open for the FCC then to go back. And uh, with that, I'll yield to the um, Republican leader the rest of my time. Thank you, Mr. Shimkus. Um, I want to go back to this issue of, of universal fund and taxation of the Internet and draw your attention to page 17 of the order, uh, paragraph 58. And my question is this, Council, it says, and I quote from the order, we partially forbear from Section 254D and associated rules insofar as they would immediately require mandatory universal service contributions associated with broadband internet access service. And then on page 204 of the order, Section 432, um, that deals with the state ability to impose uh, uh, USF contributions and, and other fees and taxes on the internet, the concluding line on Section 432, uh, after the Commission says it forbears, it says, at least until the Commission rules on whether to provide for such contributions. And finally, on page 235, Section 488, uh, it says, notwithstanding the foregoing, for now we do forbear in part from the first sentence of Section 254D and other uh, and our associated rules insofar as they would immediately require new universal service access fees. So the question I have is, if this is getting locked into statute, it appears to me that the FCC in their forbearance says, uh, for now you can't do this, or until we rule you can't do this. Does that not open the door for the, a future FCC to act? Congressman, under Section 2B1 of the bill, the FCC's decision, the order, report and order on remand, the declaratory ruling, and the order on forbearance would be restored as of January 19th, 2017. But the language... And on, go ahead. Sorry. And then on that date, the Commission had not revisited those forbearance decisions. They were but, still but, standing But as the they language were. of the forbearance itself, which is being put into statute, says until we do such things or for now, which would imply that they have the authority under their own forbearance to act in the future. Is that not the, re the, the clear reading of this? Congressman, under Section 2B1, their decisions as of January 19th, 2017. But their decision says for now we're doing this or until we do something else. So you're yes. saying that they have no further, this is like a CRA. They, you have com, this bill would completely lock into place the forbearance, and the FCC could do nothing else in any of this space on these issues going forward. As an effect on January 19th, 2017, the order on forbearance would be restored as it was in effect on that day. Right, and, and just to clarify, as because I'm not an attorney either, although I stayed in the Holiday Inn, so I can practice law. <laughs> 
That means, I, to make sure I understand, that means they can't do anything further beyond the, the bright line letters of, of the forbearance, uh, and, and, and I assume that includes their footnotes as well. Congressman, it would lock in the legal import of the report and order on remand, the declaratory ruling and order as they were in effect on that date. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Chairman. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I'm going to speak a little bit in support of the Save the Internet Act. Uh, we rely on the Internet in so many aspects of our daily lives. We use it to apply for jobs, take educational courses online, communicate with family and friends, participate in social movements, and keep up with the current events. The elimination of net neutrality protection has left my constituents at risk of not being able to access certain information online, their access to certain information being slowed down, or simply being priced out of the market. This is why it's critical that we restore meaningful net neutrality protections by, saving, by passing the Save the Internet Act. This legislation is also critical for more than 31,000 small businesses in my district. Small businesses rely on the internet to sell their products, advertise their services, and engage with current and potential customers across the globe. For startups and small businesses, net neutrality does lower barriers to entry, creating a level playing field, and it enables them to complete, compete with, small, uh, with large companies. So without net neutrality protections, it's harder for small, businesses, uh, small business owners to get his or her business off the ground and successfully compete in the marketplace. Greater challenges for small businesses means less innovation, job creation, and less economic growth. It's certainly not the future I want for my district and our community. I do urge my colleagues uh, to support this legislation. It's simple. It saves the Internet. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll yield Chairman back. You. Oh, uh, I'll yield to the Chairman of the Committee. Thank you. Thank you. I just uh, I want to thank the gentleman from California. You know, I just wanted to say that um, it's clear that this bill restores FCC's authority that's critical to protecting the lifeline and the universal service programs. And it also provides internet service providers with fair access to rights of way. And these programs will help advance rural deployment and ensure access to broad broadband for hardworking families and veterans as well. But I also wanted to say, you know, I hear from the other side of the aisle these suggestions that somehow, you know, uh, putting back in place net neutrality is uh, contrary to freedom or suggestions were made, you know, we're moving towards socialism or communism. I, I mean, I, I don't, I have no idea how this ideological perspective is being brought up on the Republican side because the reality is, um, when the government, the government has to step in to prevent monopolies. I think that Ms. Uh, Eshu said something about that, how you know, increasingly um, you know, consumers have no alternatives, they have no choices. Um, and, and what we're trying to do by restoring net neutrality is basically providing choices, providing uh, uh, opportunity for different ideological perspectives to be heard rather than stifled. I don't think there's anything more democratic than the principle of a free and open internet and net neutrality. To me, it's, it's just the opposite. We know that historically, oftentimes, you know, we saw it with the big trusts in the 19th century, we see this monopolistic tendency on the part of, of uh, American companies, and it's important to, to, to prevent that. I mean, there are times when Congress has to step in to say, look, if we want to have a, a true marketplace of ideas, if we want to have innovation, if we want to have a democratic process, in this case with the internet, then we have to restore the principle of a free and open internet. That is not communist, that's not socialist, that is very much pro-freedom and allowing for different viewpoints and innovations to take place. So, you know, I have to respond to this notion that somehow you know, when we are trying to establish this uh, net neutrality principle that somehow that, uh, you know, goes against the grain of our democracy or our freedoms. It's just the opposite. One of the reasons why uh, a free and open in internet is so successful because it allows the marketplace, or I'll say capitalism, to, to thrive. And if you thwart that, 
and you allow mono, uh, uh, monopolies to take place, then the notion of a free marketplace, of an open internet, of uh, you know, people being able to exchange ideas and sell things uh, in a, in a, uh, through freedom of movement disappears. And that's what, that's what we're trying to say here on our side of the aisle. I, I think the Republicans feel the same way. Maybe they have a different way of going about it. But don't suggest that somehow um, trying to restore a free and open internet is contrary to freedom or contrary to democracy. It's not true. It simply is not the case. I, I yield back to the gentleman. Thank you for the time. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Chairman. Uh, for what purpose does the word. gentleman seek to be recognized? I move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to uh, get a little bit of a clarification. According to a fact sheet released by the majority, the bill would, I quote, stop the FCC from applying more than 700 regulations under the Communications Act. So I'd ask the council, can you cite, please, for us, which provision in the bill does that? Congressman, that would be Section 2B1. Okay. Um, is, uh, then I, a follow-on question to that, is there somewhere in the bill or in the underlying uh, 2015 FCC order that has a complete list of those 700-plus rules? Congressman, on, in paragraph 456, the commission outlines the provisions of law that it will apply to broadband internet access service. That's section 201, 202, 208, along with the related enforcement provisions of section 206, 207, 209, 216, 217, and the associated complaint procedures and the commission's implementing regulations. But to be clear, the commission forbears from all rate making regulations adopted under sections 201, 202, section 222, section 224, and the commission's implementing regulations, which grant certain benefits that will foster network deployment by providing telecommunications carriers. Okay, rather than, uh, if I might interrupt, I'm, uh, I understand what the sections, which sections, but there's a number in the fact sheet says 700 regulations, more than 700 regulations. So where's the list of the regulations? Congressman, it, it comes from the order itself. How do we know it's 700? Uh, it says I so mean, if we know it's 700 and we know what they are, correct? Or you know what they are. Someone knows what they are in the majority. Congressman, they are the regulations associated with the provisions foreborn from. Who counted them? Forbear Who counted the 700 regulations? The commission. The commission counted the, regula the 700 regulations. It's a, it, yes, Congressman. Then, there, then there's got to be a, well, a well, list. Would well, a gentleman somewhere. yield for one second? Well, let me, let me finish my question because well, I might be able to put this to rest. Questions of counsel should focus on what the bill does. Okay, well, that's what I'm trying to get to because okay. the fact sheet says the bill. Questions uh, about a fact sheet are not, not in the scope of the bill. Try to focus. Well, reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the fact sheet says that the bill uh, stops the FCC from applying more than 700 regulations. So it's germane to the bill. So if you don't have that list of 700 regulations today, can you get that list and provide it to the minority so we can see what those regulations are, because I think that's important that we know what they are. Again, that, that's a question for the chair, not, not counsel. Okay, well, so that, uh, Mr. That Chairman. Be directed can, at us. Okay, I'll, I'll ask you then, Mr. Chairman, can, can you uh, provide that list of 700 regulations so that we can see it? Sure. Okay, great. Um, and then following on, uh, any chance that we could get that list before we vote on today's bill? No. Okay. Um, what about, uh, well, let me, let me go on to another question. Uh, according to the, to the same fact sheet, uh, the bill would restore authorities used by the FCC since 2011 to fund rural broadband as part of the Connect American Fund. But this program was in effect for four years before the FCC adopted its 2015 Open Internet Order. So isn't this bill actually unnecessary to ensure that broadband can be funded through the Connect America Fund? That's to you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, 
back. Will, will the gentleman restate his question? I'm sorry, I wasn't. Okay, all right. According to the fact sheet released by the majority, the bill would restore authorities used by the FCC since 2011 to fund rural broadband as part of the Connect American Fund. But this program was in effect for four years before the FCC adopted its 2015 Open Internet Order. So isn't this bill actually unnecessary to ensure that broadband be, uh, can be funded through the Connect American Fund? In other words, it was already there. Yeah, the, the 2015 order uh, provided the legal underpinnings uh, for the Connect America Fund and, and for Lifeline. When the current FCC commissioner uh, threw the entire order out, he also threw out those legal underpinnings uh, for Connect America and Lifeline. And, and it, it could, a uh, point could be made uh, that, that someone could go to court and, and say that there is no legal basis for those programs. This bill uh, and the 215 order restores those legal underpinnings. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I'm reclaiming my time. I had to. Gentleman's time is 30 seconds. I had to repeat my expired. question for you, Mr. Chairman. May I ask you one? Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Pallone. Uh, what purpose? I strike the last word, Mr. Gentleman's Chairman. recognized for five minutes. I, I'm not looking to use the whole time unless somebody wants some of it, but. I'll give it to you then, too. Look, look um, I understand what Mr. Johnson said, but look, the bottom line is every effort should be made in this committee, both today in the context of this bill or down the road, in trying to expand uh, broadband. Um, so if, if, if our effort here is to make it clear that, um, you know, that the uh, Connect America Fund can be better used uh, to expand rural broadband or that other things can be done to restore authorities to fund bro uh, programs for low income or for veterans. Let's just do it and make that clear. And, but what I wanted to say is that, you know, um, our committee, and hopefully Republicans too, but certainly the Democrats, are very determined to expand broadband to underserved areas and to, uh, and to underserved people. Um, we're hoping that uh, we're gonna do a bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill at some point this session, hopefully sooner than later. And if you look at our uh, a bill that the Democrats put out called the Lift America Act, which is you know kind of a uh, a summary, if you will, of what the Democrats would like to do in an infrastructure bill for the matters that are within the jurisdiction of committee. There's a major expansion of broadband to rural, uh, urban, and other underserved areas and other people that are underserved. So that is an important part of what needs to be done here. Uh, it, you know, and, it's, and it's linked to the idea of net neutrality as well, because what we know is that you know, if somebody's in an underserved area and they don't have access, then they're gonna not be able to find a job or they're not gonna be able to get education or they're not gonna be able to sell their product. And the whole idea of a free and open internet is that, in my opinion, is that wherever you are in the country or whatever your economic, ethnic, or racial background, that you should have access and that that's a way of improving the economy and of uh, making it possible for people who have innovative ideas, wherever they happen to be or whoever they happen to be, or regardless of their income, that they can thrive. It is so important to the whole idea of the marketplace and, 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 and what this country is all about in terms of you know, what we're trying to achieve for all of our constituents. So I just wanted to mention that as well, maybe not directly on point, but Let's not worry about uh, efforts to try to expand broadband. If that's a way of clarifying this bill to make that clear, we should just do it and not, uh, not you know, get into the niceties of uh, whether or not uh, we need to do it. We need to do it because it's important uh, for the country. Uh, I don't know if anybody, yes, I, I yield to the gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before I make my point, I'd like to clarify something. It is public information, uh, the 700 regulations that was referred to by one of my colleagues, that is in fact public information from an FCC hearing and more. And so therefore, every member of this committee, uh, both the minority and the majority, have had access to that information and every single one of our staffs as well. So technically speaking, every single one of us have had full access to that information prior to this hearing and therefore prior to any vote on this matter. 
Um, but with that, what I'd like to point out is that net neutrality is extremely important for me and my constituents, and as was mentioned, to every small and large business across America. It means that everyone has access to a free and open internet, and that's what everybody wants and that's what they deserve. I have some concern about this bill's prospects in the Senate. However, I hope we can find a way forward to ensure that we can get this done for the American people. Uh, I support uh, your efforts, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman of this committee, and I will support this bill, and I thank you very much, and I yield back to, to the Chairman. Mr. Plum, do you yield back or do yes. you yield to someone else? I don't think anybody else wants my time right. Okay. Oh, Ms. Eshoo? Thank you for yielding the remainder of your time, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to note that uh, uh, here uh, at the dais is um, a list of, I've counted them, 342 organizations across the country I mean, this is an, uh, from A to Z. Uh, everything from everyone from the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education to the American uh, uh, the, uh, National Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, to uh, small businesses, medium sized businesses, large businesses. Uh, uh, media operations, institutes, Oregon State University libraries and press, to my friend, Mr. Walden. Uh, take a look at this. You know, uh, inside the Beltway, this is really about maybe five companies. Across the country, the American people really get this. And national polling shows that Republicans, Democrats, independence support net neutrality. So uh, we are, um, uh, you know, we're still in the same old soup pot here. Uh, we need to uh, take our lenses off and uh, look across the country uh, because hands down, uh, 84, 85% of the American people support this. So we're going round and round, who forbears, what does forbearance mean? Uh, you know, they're, they're good questions. They're okay questions. Uh, but you know who already gets this? Hands down, the American people. Because it's common sense to them. They know what they've had in front of them. They know the way the internet should work. They don't want these five outfits that oppose this uh, to get in the way. They don't want them to stop them. They don't want the Santa Clara County Fire District to be told by a company, if you pay us more, uh, we'll let you go, while the biggest fires of California were burning. So the time common has sense expired. is out there, and I think this committee needs to heed that. Okay. Are there any amendments to this bill? Move to strike the last <laughs> word. <laughs> uh, We've just we'll first uh, recognize, for what purpose does the general lady seek to be we'll recognized? Just write the last word. General lady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I agree with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, and I think we all do. We, on both sides of the aisle, support an open and free internet. We don't want blocking, we don't want throttling, we don't want paid prioritization. But unfortunately, and I think what this hearing is showing, is that words in the bills matter and concepts in the bills that we are debating matter. And so I'm very concerned about our country potentially falling behind in the competitive advantage in 5G technology. And so I do have a question for council a bit about what this bill might or might not do. Title II order treated all broadband providers the same, regardless of whether they delivered broadband over a wireline or a wireless connection. And by all accounts, this bill does bestow a great deal of power on the federal government to, tr to uh, control transfers and transactions involving management of common carriers. This is contained in sections 214, 215, and 218 specifically. None of these provisions are forborn on not a word I've ever used before, by the way. Uh, can you please cite the provision of the bill or the order that would prohibit this or a future FCC from nationalizing a 5G network? Something that I think we must stay very focused on or facilitating the assembly of a national 5G network with this authority. 
Just to clarify the question, ma'am, it's which provision of the bill would prohibit the FCC from nationalizing the 5G yes. network? Yes. Are there any provisions in the bill that would prohibit the FCC from, from in the future nationalizing a 5G network? The, the bill would restore the 2015 Open Internet Order. It did not address the prospect of nationalizing a 5G network. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, move the balance of my time uh, to our ranking member, Chairman Walden. I, I thank the gentlelady. Um, and I want to go back to council with a couple of questions because we, we had this discussion about footnotes. And if I recall correctly, you indicated that these footnotes would also be locked in under this legislation to law. Correct? Congressman, the, the statements in the order would be locked in in the context of the larger order and its legal import. What, but that includes the footnotes, correct? It would be the legal import of the order. Okay, uh, if, I, if I understand what you're saying. Um, then there are two footnotes I want to draw your attention to on pages 225 and 236, because they both relate to the, the topic at hand. Um, uh, order uh, paragraph 470, no, 470 and, uh, I don't know how we tell you the footnote, 472 it looks like, 14, I'm sorry, 1472 uh, footnote and, and 1474. Okay, so the, the question here is this, 1472 and 1474, um, the commission said they weren't making decisions at this time on uh, universal service fund contribution reform, that that's better done in another docket. So they were forbearing from making decisions about USF contribution reform. The same is true in section 470 about TRS obligate, contribution obligations. They said for now we're gonna forbear, um, but this is something we'll probably look at later on. Now my understanding from the answer to my earlier questions was if they said they were forbearing for now, that meant forbearance forever, once this is locked into law, correct? The order or the bill would restore the order as it was in effect on January 19th, 2017. Help me understand. I, that was not the question. The question is, as a lawyer, and I'm not, so I need your help here, and you're doing a great job. The question is, if it says forbear for now, does that give the commission the opportunity to go forward with additional rulemaking, or does that say because it's foreborn for now, it's foreborn forever once this is in statute? Because the chairman has indicated, and I think I'm correct here, Mr. Chairman, that you said... This locks in everything frozen in time as of now. And as of now, they had forborne. Is that accurate? Congressman, to the extent the commission had not revisited any of those conditional issues that you raise on January 19th, right. 2017. The, the date of the order. Okay. So what that means for people that are watching, there can never be contribution reform for USF or TRS going forward by the commission unless Congress acts to change the law. Because you are now enacting in law all the forbearances as they were on that date, including the footnotes, according to counsel. So that means any contribution reform for USF is frozen out. I'm not sure why you have a joint commission at that point, but that's why these words actually matter, because when we lock this into law, or you all do, you're, you're locking down the commission from any change that they hadn't already contemplated here, and my time's expired. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Chairman. For what purpose does the gentlelady from New York seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move to strike the last word. And General lady's recognized uh, for five minutes. My colleagues, this bill is crystal clear. The bill says Congress, quote, restores as an effect on January 19, 2017, unquote, the entire 2015 open internet order, including the forbearances. By, by, by specifying that date, the Save the Internet Act would stop the clock and freeze the order on forbearances exactly as it was in effect on January 19, 2017. An agency like the FCC may not act contrary to the law or an unambiguously expressed intent of Congress. The Save the Internet Act is direct, unambiguous, and leaves no room for interpretation. The Save the Internet Act would restore the FCC's 2015 order in its entirety. 
This includes both the express protections and express forbearances laid out in the report and order a, a remand, the declaratory, the declaratory ruling, and three, the order on forbearances. It would be just the type of absurd result that courts strike down if the FCC were to argue Congress restored this order in the Save the Internet Act only to allow the FCC to undo the forbearances at a later point. So we are where we are. It's clear. It's written. With that, Mr. Chairman, I, does any other colleague wish uh, I acknowledge Mr. Yu, Lu, Luhan? Thank you very much. Uh Congresswoman Clark, a question to the council because of the question associated with the universal service program, how does this legislation restore the legal underpinnings of the universal service program? Congressman, whenever the FCC extended the Lifeline program to cover broadband internet access service, it did so using uh, sections two, or 706 and provisions related to telecommunications service that this bill would restore. Similarly, whenever the FCC issued the 2011 Universal Service Transformation and Intercarrier Compensation Reform Order, uh, it relied in part on Section 706 of the Communications Act. And is it correct that Chairman Pai's order rejected the Commission's authority under Section 706, which along with authority under Title II provided the legal authority for USF program to be applied to broadband? Yes, Congressman, that is correct. So what's... Is the effect of rejecting 706 uh, um, with Chairman Pai's order, does that hurt or help deployment of universal service um, in rural America? It would provide, a by restoring the 2015 Open Internet Order, Section 2B1 of the bill would restore those legal authorities. So, Mr. Chairman, the reason I ask this question is, as a member that represents a rural community, 47,000 square miles, not quite as large as one state, but larger than many states across America, the importance and the urgency of what we have to be doing with these initiatives matters. I know it's a, something that is shared. Chairman Walden did a lot to, uh, during his time as well to protect the Universal Service Fund. We've talked about expanding this from a broadband perspective, but it's also one of those areas with Chairman Pai's order that would hurt um, rural America. And so uh, I hope that there's bipartisan support to address this issue going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back to Ms. Clark. Mr. Chairman. Does the general lady yield back? Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General lady Mr. yields Chairman. back. Uh, for Chairman. what purpose does the Mr. G and Forty seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. So I want to thank counsel for helping us understand this bill because this is this is very important. We consider these, and not, my concern is primarily rural America. Just as a gentleman across the aisle, um, we heard in testimony here. Uh, during the prior hearing that, in fact, rural ISPs under the 200 and 2015 rule were unable to get access to capital. So I just would like ask the council to point out to me which section of the bill uh, provides certainty for small and mid-sized rural providers that they'll be able to have access to capital. Congressman, I would defer to the members of this panel of the effect. I could say that the by restoring the 2015 order, Section 2B1 would restore the relevant authorities the FCC has previously used to expand broadband internet access. Just to understand the content of the bill, is there any section in the bill that uh, guarantees that rural broadband providers will have access to capital? Congressman, I would, I would just return to the is, refrain that Section 2B1 would restore uh, the universal service provisions that applied to broadband internet access service that do fund uh, rural broadband deployment through the FCC's mechanisms. So again, on the, context, the content of the bill, is there any section that talks specifically about rural broadband providers and access to capital? Section 254, which would be restored as applied to broadband internet access service, would continue to apply, uh, apply as it's written in the Communications Act to uh, carriers in high cost and insular areas. I'm not sure I, I'm not a lawyer, but. So section, section 254 of the act is the provision that the commission uses to fund uh, broadband through the universal service program. It would apply to broadband internet access service under this bill, and so the FCC could provide funding uh, to broadband internet access service pursuant to that provision. Okay, under the 215 rules, um, we heard in testimony that 
access, access to capital wasn't as available. Um, but this bill doesn't do anything different than the 2015 rules that would have changed that in any way for rural broadband providers. That is correct, Congressman. Okay. Um, and then, could you highlight any section of the bill that provides certainty for these small and rural providers that they'll be able to make a return on their investment without being subject to rate regulations? I could cite two provisions of the order. I would again return to section 254, which also provides funding for rate of return carriers in, in rural areas. Uh, 2B1 would also uh, enshrine the forbearances of sections 201 and 202 and the associated rate making uh, provisions to the extent they could be used to set rates for broadband internet access service. And the bill would also forbear from sections 203, 204, and 205, which the commission uses uh, to require telecommunications carriers to file a schedule of rates. So the, if we adopt this measure, the FCC would have an increased ability to regulate rates. C Congressman, I would, I would say the commission forbears and would be permanently for, would not be able to revisit the decisions on forbearance with regard to 203, 204, 205, and 201 and 202 to the extent that they're used to set rates. So under this bill, would they have more rate regulation ability or less rate regulation ability? I, other than those provisions that I cited, I'm unaware of the commission ever using other provisions to rate regulate a mass market service of the type broadband internet okay. access services. And here, just if, one last question if I could. Um, the FCC can choose to forbear from applying a regulation if it finds enforcement of the regulations is not necessary or to ensure practices are just and reasonable, not necessary for the protection of consumers, and forbearance from applying the provision is consistent with the public interest. Independent of this bill, I'm just asking generally about forbearance. What does the FCC have to do if they were to choose to unforbear from applying a provision? Congressman, uh, it, it, as you noted, the question is outside of the scope of the bill since it's not something, if you're speaking about Section 10 generally. Yeah, questions of counsel should be focused on the bill, okay, not on, on questions about the intent or broader policy. Those are more properly directed to the sponsor of the chair. Okay, I want to thank the counsel for his input, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Chairman. Uh, for what purpose does the gentlelady from Michigan seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to comment about what we're really here to do, which is we're, trying, we're asking a lot of questions and making this really complicated, and it's really simple. Today we're addressing a wrong that was created by Chairman Pai when he abolished net neutrality, and he hurt millions of Americans across this country. Ignoring the outpouring of comments uh, against the proposal that took away the net neutrality, ignoring the thousands of fake comments, ignoring the evidence when he falsely claimed, not only to the public, but to this committee, to myself and Mr. McNary, that the FCC had come under a cyber attack during the open comment period. So today, we're breaking with that tradition and listening to people. And instead of ignoring what our constituents have asked us to do, we're going to do something to protect the internet from the harms that Chairman Pai exposed it to. This bill does exactly what the American people have asked for. They don't want their ISP, ISP to decide that certain websites load faster than others. They just want their music or video or pictures to load when they want them. We aren't ignoring the ringing of phones and the overflowing inboxes that supporters of net neutrality made happen. The people have spoken quite loudly that they want net neutrality. Hundreds of people who have never contacted our offices before have sent emails to all offices and have made phone calls in support of this bill. And the message has been clear, protect my internet. And that's what our job is to do. We're marking up this bill because in a world with so much inequality, the least we should be doing 
is making sure that every American, no matter where they live, no matter what their income, no matter what their education is, has access to the same internet and is free from digital redlining. We're ensuring that the information that's able to be accessed is decided by those billions of clicks every day, and we're making sure that remains the case for years to, go to come. Today, we're making sure that there are clear rules and a cop on the beat to ensure that the only one deciding what priority is given to the content is the user. So today, we're ensuring we have an actual open internet that's affordable to every American. I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. General Chairman. Yields back. Uh, Mr. Chairman. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I have two questions for counsel. Because the FCC did not think it had enough authority under the pre-2015 rules that were in place for a long, long time, the 2015 Wheeler Order established, quote, unquote, the catch-all rule which would prevent broadband providers from unreasonable interfering or disadvantaging the content applications and devices of another customer's choosing. The FCC relied on its authority under sections 201, I'm sorry, 202 and 706 as a legal underpinning for this quote unquote general conduct standard, end quote, and said it would evaluate conduct using a list of seven non-exclusive factors. These factors are end use control, competitive effects, consumer protection, the effect on innovation, investment, or broadband deployment, free expression, application agnostic, and standard practices." End quote. My question is, does H.R. 1644 do anything to limit the number of factors the FCC consider when evaluating broadband provider conduct under the quote unquote general conduct standard. No, Congressman. No. So I'm concerned with that answer that HR 1644 would have a chilly effect on innovation because broadband providers would be forced to ask, Mother, may I? before engaging in a new venture. That is not a free and open internet. Question number two, healthcare providers sometimes zero rate videos, no charges, so consumers can learn more about a healthy habit or how to address an ailment. Could the FCC use its authorities under section 201 or its general conduct rule to prohibit content providers from offering socially beneficial videos to consumers via zero rating? Congressman, in paragraph 152 of the order, the commission says, quote, it is mindful of the concerns raised in the record that sponsored data plans have the potential to distort competition by allowing service providers to pick and choose among application providers to feature on different service plans. At the same time, new service offerings, depending on how they are structured, could benefit consumers and com competition. Accordingly, the Commission will look and assess such practices under the no unreasonable interference and disadvantage standard based on the facts of each individual case and take action as necessary. Thank you. It sounds like Section 152 says yes. If situation arises, the FCC can use authorities under general conduct rule to prohibit zero-rate videos that help people with ailments and healthy habits. I yield the best of my time my friend from Illinois, Mr. Kinziger. Thank you for yielding. This is just such a wonderful time. Thank you all. Uh, a few questions for counsel. Uh, in a general case under Title II, the FCC has several authorities, including rate regulations, right? Just general case. Congressman, I would, I would say that that question is, is beyond the scope of this bill. Well, okay, okay. Then under the 2015 order, the FCC decided to forbear from some of these authorities, right? Yes, Congressman. And just as the FCC changed its mind and repealed the 2015 order, it actually could have just amended various elements of that order instead of a full repeal, correct? 
Congressman, I would I would leave that discussion to the panel about what what authority the commission may have had to take it. Well, then I, I okay. The answer is yes, but if you want to, I understand. Since the bill restores, so we're talking about the bill now. Since it restores the 2015 order as in effect before it was repealed, as you said on January of 2017, the FCC would again have all the authorities it had prior to the repeal. Correct. Under the open internet order, as they were in effect on January 19th, 2017. And so if the bill becomes law, the FCC would have all the Title II authorities available to it, and the FCC could change its mind with respect to forbearance, correct? No, Congressman. It could not change its mind? No, Congressman. Why not? Because Under Section 2B1 of the bill, the commission, uh, or the bill, would restore as in effect on January 19th, 2017, and so those decisions... Uh, to the extent they were in effect on that date, the commission would lack the discretion to revisit them. All right. Well, I'm out of time. I'll yield back. Yield back. I, I see, Mr. Kissinger, you have an amendment. Do you want to offer it? No, you want to strike the last word. I'll move to strike the last word. Do you, or, to offer an amendment? No. Oh, well, then, uh, <laughs> for what purpose does the general lady from California seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Uh, the gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. I yield to the gentleman from uh, California, Mr. McNerney. I thank the gentlelady from, for yielding. Uh, say, under the current regime, there's no cop on the beat to protect consumers from ISPs throttling, blocking, or paid prioritization. The only cop out there really is the FTC, and they're only able allowed to um, enforce when when ISPs do false advertising. So basically what we're going to be seeing is throttling, paid prioritization, and blocking. We're going to be seeing those things creeping up farther and farther. It's going to happen. When there's no one to protect the consumer, that's going to happen. The Save the Internet Act revi revives the FCC's common sense consumer protections, ensuring that the Internet is a fair and free platform for years and years to come. It selectively applies certain provisions of Title II like non-discrimination protections, equal access for people with disabilities, and consumer complaint and enforcement processes. But the Save the Internet Act does not apply to the outdated telephone-specific Title II sections and, regulated, uh, and, and related regulations. The Save the Internet Act protects the interests of consumers and their choice of Internet service providers and the ways in which they use the Internet. It also protects small businesses that need to reach real consumers. Now, I've been bringing this, this issue up over and over. Small businesses need protection if they want to compete against the big guys. That's what this does. ISPs may seek fees from edge providers to deliver content clear and faster consumers, fees that small companies and startups can't afford to pay. And large edge, provi edge providers with money and leverage may seek preferential and discriminatory treatment to the detriment of smaller businesses and startups. And you can bet this is going to happen. I mean, if there's no enforcement to prevent it, it's going to happen. That's the nature of business. The Save the Internet Act will stop ISPs from engaging in unreasonable, unjust, and discriminatory practices, <clears throat> both for their own benefit and for the benefit of an edge provider seeking such treatment. Anyone else need a time? All right, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, well, the general lady, are you yielding back? General lady yields back her time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? I uh, to strike the last word, Mr. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield the balance of my time to uh, Mr. Walden. I thank the gentleman from Florida. So, I want to pursue a couple of things. One, um, it's my understanding, Mr. Chairman, that. What we're doing here today is locking in the forbearance uh, and, and the entire uh, scheme that the Wheeler FCC put in place. And the response I've gotten from counsel is, everything that's in that order, including the footnotes, is locked in time and statute and cannot be altered as of that. And yeah, the FCC would have thing. no authority to alter any of those items one way or the other, correct? Because that's what, that's what you've said, that's what Council has kind of indicated, uh, based on your role, um, that, that none of that can be changed. Now, we also have heard from Mr. McDowell and others that Section 201 and 202 
give an open door to the FCC to go do a lot of rulemaking through the APA. And they could go through and do a lot of the things uh, over on that side. So on the one hand, we're being assured that the FCC is locked in under forbearance, can't do anything here. But however, over on 201 and 202, they could go forward and do all these things. So I'm not sure which it is, but it appears to be both. And then when you get to the issue of what we heard, digital redlining and priority given to content is the users, which I share that concern that Ms. Dingell uh, raised. This doesn't do anything on the edge providers. And we've had hearings in this committee. We had Mr. Zuckerberg for five hours. We had the CEO of Twitter for hours before us talking about concerns our constituents have about shadow banning, about prioritization, about their sites not loading, about discrimination, all the kind of digital redlining my office is hearing about, and, and lack of control over content. And, and so my, my questions for counsel go to the, the whole part about what does this bill do on net neutrality to impact edge providers? So can you show me, counsel, in this bill where edge providers such as Google or Facebook, great American companies do marvelous things, but where this net neutrality bill would affect them on anything they do in terms of blocking, throttling, paid prioritization, shadow banning, all those sorts of alleged behaviors. Can you cite where, that, where they're covered by this? Congressman, this bill would not treat edge providers as common carriers or otherwise impose obligations on edge providers. It is possible that some edge providers who offer broadband service could be considered common carriers, but only to the extent they were engaged in broadband internet on access. The broadband, service. okay, agreed. So if, if that's the case, then the concerns my constituents have raised about um, when they're on the ecosystem of the internet, they want Frankly, a lot of them want everybody treated the same, whether it's an ISP or an edge provider, because the ISPs are, in fact, the freeways, and the edge providers are, in fact, the off-ramps in the neighborhood uh, city streets where actually you go for your content. And they're concerned that somehow their stuff gets blocked. I think about our former colleague on this committee, Ms. Blackburn, whose video was blocked, or Elizabeth Warren, whose video was blocked. These are the things we hear about a lot and I think are legitimate concerns about how content on the internet gets blocked by somebody, and in this case, edge providers. So I'm not aware of any incidents of ISPs blocking content in this manner. So it's hard to see how this bill protects free speech. It is a, it is a problem. But what we do see is that by locking in these forbearances and the order, we are locking down the FCC from any future look at things like the TRS contribution obligations, like universal service fund changes, um, and, and contributions uh, going forward. So we're tying the hands of the FCC on the one hand to keep modernizing uh, their regulations because you're putting all of this locked in space and time uh, from 2015 into statute. And meanwhile, the Internet's great vibrancy and growth has occurred with really light touch regulation. We could find common ground in this committee today to block, to prevent throttling, blocking, paid prioritization. We could pass that out of here unanimously and in a bipartisan way, send it to the Senate, and I think President Trump would sign that bill into law, and we could prevent the kind of bad behaviors. Where we're having this argument is over how much do you want this FCC, by the way, the Trump FCC, to have this unprecedented regulatory authority through Title II to go do things or not, or how, whether you tie the hands of the government. I, I just think the Internet's done really well with light-touch regulation, and the only time it had this heavy-handed regulation was for about less than two years. And so um, I, I, it's too bad we can't get there today, but maybe along the way we will, and I yield back. Back is time. Who seeks recognition? General Lady from California, for what purpose do you seek recognition? Move to strike the last word, Mr. General Lady is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, the memorandum reads, Subcommittee Markup, Markup of H.R. 1644, Save the Internet Act of 2019. Now, I, I think that these are interesting questions of the Council. Um, and if we want to continue this, I would suggest that we have a roundtable to go through the entire Telecommunications Act and, uh, and more, if members wish. 
But this is a markup, Mr. Chairman. And if we're not going to mark up, then we should just shut this down and continue our day with the, all the other things on the calendar. Uh, I, I know that there are amendments that were uh, uh, placed in the hopper. Uh, can we move to the amendments so that we actually have a markup on the bill? That's my question to you. Uh, General Lady Yield? Sure. <laughs> I would hope we're going to get there shortly. Uh, as I see the re well, members Well, let me ask the, uh, 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 taking back my time, can I ask the uh, uh, ranking member of the subcommittee, oh. uh, do you plan to get to amendments today? And if so, approximately what time? Does the general lady yield? I do. Thank you very much. Well, at this time, you know, the members uh, on our side have been asking the uh, questions uh, on, the, on the bill and striking the last word. No, I'm asking what time you think we will get to amendments being offered. Well, I know that. It's a simple uh, question. Uh, I, Maybe, is there another part, hour? If, if the uh, general lady yields. Sure. Uh, from my time on the committee, I don't think uh, we've looked at the time as to when we're going to get to a specific issue. It's mainly hearing from the members. I don't know. I don't know what that means. Well, my uh, time. General, general lady yields. Sure. Well, again, uh, we're hearing from the members with their concerns through the uh, striking the last word on the, the bill itself. Well, uh, taking back my uh, uh, time, uh, I, I'm really serious about this. I'm not trying to be cute about it. Uh, but it's, it's noontime, and it's a markup. I appreciate the questions. I appreciate the questions. Uh, 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 but with all due respect to the council, he doesn't have a vote. We do. We're supposed to be marking up the bill. If there are no amendments to be offered, I think the chair needs to be notified. Uh, but I also think uh, that we need to move forward uh, with this. And I'm only asking, what time do you think you're going to start your amendments? Maybe that's the most direct question. Is there anyone on the other side that can tell us that? Well, again, if the gentleman yields, uh, again, mm -hmm. uh, this is very important that the members ask their uh, questions on yeah, the and a, bill. And taking back my time, what time? Is that, do you have two more hours of questions to ask the council? An um, hour and a half? If the, if the general lady yields, I know that my chair, when I uh, chaired a subcommittee, I never worried about the question at the time <clears throat> because we want to make sure that all members were heard. Yeah, well, reclaiming my time, I think it's a legitimate question. It doesn't seem to me that you have an answer. Is there anyone else? Mr. Walton, do you? If generally you'll yield, my Be friend, to? California. I think we're about done with this because we're about done with Hallelujah. members to ask okay. questions. All right. But I, I would argue that I think Mr. Long wanted to ask some questions, and that is his right as a and member of this committee. And then we're going to get to amendments. And not, yeah, and then Wonderful. And I anticipate because okay. I think on our side we run out of members faster than you do on your side, unfortunately. Well, um, and then <laughs> you see, they voted in November and talked into right. that. That's right. Was net neutrality. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. General Lady yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Long seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. Mr. Long, you're recognized for five minutes. I'm just thinking if we hadn't had a discussion on about how long it's going to take till we get around to it, we'd have got there three minutes earlier if we hadn't been talking about it. Uh, I've got a couple of short questions for counsel. Under 201 and or 202, could the FCC itself mandate the throttling of content if it is determined to be just and reasonable to manage the efficient provision of the broadband services? Congressman, I think under the 2015 Open Internet Order, the Commission allows an, exam an exemption from the uh, throttling and blocking rules for reasonable network management. Can you repeat that? I'm going open that door. I couldn't hear that last part. Under the 2015 order, the Commission includes an exemption to the blocking and throttling rules related to reasonable network management. If it was determined just and reasonable. If, if what was determined just and reasonable? Well, that the content, it, I'll re, re, repeat it or rephrase it. Uh, under 201 and or 202, could the FCC itself 
mandate the throttling of content if it was determined if it determined it was just and reasonable to manage the efficient provision of broadband services. Sorry, I misunderstood your question. Um, I'm unaware of the commission ever mandating such a practice under Section 201 and, and 202. Could they? I, I, in any time when they'd be interpreting Section 201 and 202, they'd have to go through the normal um, Administrative Procedures Act. I think under this rule, since there's an affirmative requirement for no throttling, that they'd have to They'd have to overturn the order that in this case would be restored as an effect on January uh, 19th, 2017. And as a result, I think it would take an act of Congress to allow something like that unless it were under the reasonable network management exception that the providers were doing on their own motion. But it, I, if they determined it just and reasonable, they wouldn't be prohibited, would they? I think the hypothetical, Congressman, it would put the commission in the position of having to overturn the ban on throttling, which it could not do. Okay, uh, is it possible that, moving on, uh, is it possible that the FCC could impose a network management fee on internet services? Let me start that over. Is it, uh, is it, is it possible that the FCC could impose a network management fee on internet service providers if it determined it to be just and reasonable? Congressman, again, I'm unfamiliar with the commission taking action like that, and I would go back to the Internet Tax Freedom Act that was made permanent in 2016 that prohibits states and localities in taxing broadband internet access service and the forbearances from Section 254D and the TRS-related exceptions that Mr. Walden pointed out earlier. Okay, uh, I yield to Mr. Walton. Uh, thank you, and this, this has triggered something else, and, and I am trying to finish up here to my colleague from California, and maybe this is best for legislative counsel. So if, if this legislation locks in all the forbearances and everything date certain, right, and that's what it does, that's what we've been told, if the commission goes to do something under Section 201 and 202 through the APA process, that is in conflict with what is locked in under this statute with this forbearance, which prevails? And maybe legislative counsel can help me on this. Does, does the 2B prevail or does 201 and 202? If the, if the F, future FCC goes through a 201, 202 rulemaking process, but what they're doing over here is different than what's locked in over here under this legislation, which one would prevail? And how would that be determined? Uh, Congressman, um, I think that would pose an issue of statutory construction, as you've uh, pointed out. Uh, in, in order to answer that question, I think we would um, probably need to see, um, look further into whether um, this sort of construction, restoring a rule as an effect on a date certain, uh, alters the um, FCC's ability to um, amend that rule uh, in the future. That's something that I'd be happy to look into. Um, and well, that, that's a hugely important point. I know my time's expired, but um, if you're able to get back to us, that would be very, very helpful, I think. We all want to know what we're doing here. That's the whole point of these questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Chairman, Are there any amendments to the bill? <laughs> I seek what, recognition. For what purpose does the For the, the purpose of, if Ms. Eshoo is listening carefully, offering an amendment. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, let me ask, uh, Madam Clerk, was the amendment submitted within the two-hour lead time for review? Um, yes, sir. I want to check on the number. Yeah, which, which, which your amendment number? Which amendment? It's the small business exemption when I don't have the number in right. front of me. Yep. Sorry. I have it. Yes, sir. I think we filed them last night. Yeah. Right. The, all the amendments were filed at the time, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And are there copies there for distribution at the desk? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. The clerk will report the amendment. Mr. Chairman. 
Yes, General Amendment Lady. to H.R. 1644 offered by Mr. Walden. At the end of the bill, add the following. Section 3, exception Chairman, to enhancement. I'd like to uh, reserve a point of order. Enhancement to trans transparency requirements for small businesses. Without objection, the reading of the amendment will be dispensed with. The uh, gentlewoman from the state of California. Yeah, the gentlewoman from the state of California has raised a point of order. Do you uh, insist on your point of order? Yes, I do. Not at this time. Okay. I reserve. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, the gentleman's offered an amendment. Yes. Uh, you Sir, have may I speak on the amendment? I'd like to be recognized to speak on the amendment. Yes, gentleman's recognized for five minutes to Thank speak you, on Chair. his amendment. Well, we've obviously focused much of our attention on Title II and the, what we believe to be the heavy-handed government control take over the Internet that H.R. 1644 would establish. There's another consequence that would stem from reinstating the FCC's 2015 Open Internet Order that's not received as much attention. H.R. 1644 would put all of the FCC's 2015 Open Internet rules back on the books, including the Enhanced Transparency Rule. Now, as members of the committee who were here last Congress and in, in the one before will recall, this Enhanced Transparency Rule required all broadband providers to disclose additional information well beyond the FCC's 2010 disclosure requirements. While I'm supportive of protecting consumers, these enhanced disclosures place an unnecessary regulatory burden on our smallest of uh, small ISPs and distracted them from investing to bring more broadband internet to unserved areas across the country, especially in rural districts uh, in Mexico, Oregon, and elsewhere. 2015, FCC even recognized the burden that these enhanced disclosures would place on small businesses, and the 2015 Open Internet Order temporarily exempted small ISPs with 100,000 or fewer subscribers from those enhanced disclosures. But despite the overwhelming support in the record for a permanent extension, can the Commission failed to make this exemption permanent and instead subjected many small businesses to the serious reporting burden as well as a lot of uncertainty around what the future might hold in terms of compliance with enhanced disclosures. I also recognize the burdens this enhanced transparency requirements imposed on small ISPs. I was not alone. I think, uh, in fact, every member of the House voted for uh, the amendment I'm offering today or its version. Uh, my district in Eastern Oregon was affected by this. My Democratic colleague, Representative Loebsack from Iowa, had a similar concern for the burden imposed on small ISPs in his district by the enhanced transparency rule. And through a, a pretty vigorous negotiation, Republicans and Democrats came together. We worked together to find a compromise that extended the exemption for another five years, as well as increased the threshold for our smallest of ISP providers. The Small Business Broadband Deployment Act of H.R. 4596 received strong bipartisan support in the 114th Congress. In fact, it passed the House unanimously with a vote of 411 to zero. In the 115th Congress, we came back and reintroduced it as H.R. 288 with Mr. Loebsack as an original co-sponsor, and this compromise uh, legislation reflected the balance between protecting consumers' access to information and protecting small internet service providers' ability to better serve their customers. It also reflected the strength of a bipartisan legislative process, um, something that I was very serious about uh, pursuing as chairman of the full committee. So this legislation now before us would not include um, this kind of relief for our ISPs. And so, Mr. Chairman, our amendment today uh, is what nearly everybody on the committee has voted for on one or two occasions already, has passed the House, and I think would provide important regulatory uh, relief for our smallest ISPs who, before this committee, have said this kind of reporting just takes money away from our ability to invest and, and serve our consumers. And so I think it's a really uh, good bipartisan amendment that eventually we'd like to get past the Senate if we're going to put these rules back in place um, that we've all agreed to before, and I see no reason why we wouldn't accept that today. And I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Does anyone else wish to speak on the amendment? The gentleman for California, for what purpose do you seek to be recognized? Mr. Chairman, I seek recognition in opposition to the amendment. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. I, I do appreciate the gentleman's amendment, and I would note that I and the other co-sponsors of Save the Internet do care deeply about protecting small business. I've spoken about that several times this morning. 
One of the principal aims, in fact, of H.R. 1644 is to protect small businesses from big ISPs. However, as you know, Democratic members, including Mr. Loebsack, worked on a bipartisan basis on the Small Business Broadband Deployment Act when it was introduced back in 2016. This bill included a carve-out for some small ISPs from the enhancements to the FCC's transparency rule. Critically, though, this bill included a five-year sunset that had the bill become law, we would be approaching. When we took up the bill, the purpose was to give some small ISPs some space to work, but some consumers served by, by these small providers would have less transparency, would be provided with less transparency. The Small Business Development, uh, Small Business Broadband Deployment Act even required the FCC to submit a report to Congress within 180 days specifically so that Congress could reevaluate whether to repeal, amend, or make the exemption permanent. This amendment takes the bill's language from back in 2016 and puts it back into play, including transparency changes with important information for consumers. For example, among the things an exemption would deprive consumers of is transparency about promotional rates, one-time or recurring fees, and data caps. That said, we are prepared to work on this issue heading into the full committee, but we're just seeing the amendment now, and I can't in good faith vote for a transparency, for less transparency for consumers without reevaluating the work we did in the 114th Congress. I'd like to work with the gentleman to see if we can find some middle ground here, and I would just note that if the gentleman would withdraw the amendment, I think we can work together to resolve the issue on the way to full committee. Would the gentleman yield? Je yes, the gentleman yields. Um, you know, this is kind of a hard pill to swallow. I realize we're in the minority and you're in the majority, but this is something we agreed to twice and worked out and negotiated the, the framework on. Um, and we did so, as you did, in good faith in the, both of those agreements. And frankly, every member of the House voted for this twice. And while it, you refer to it going back to 2016 or whatever, for heaven's sakes, we're going back to the 2015 FCC order under your legislation. And it seems only reasonable that we would continue forward, if you're gonna do that, with this amendment to provide that relief. Um, We're coming my time, uh, will the gentleman agree to uh, withdraw the amendment? I, I am always open to working with the majority um, to provide relief to the IS, small ISPs so they can expand access to consumers. I'm willing to withdraw the amendment um, on the good faith notion that I'd like to hear from Mr. Loebsack, though, since he was a co-sponsor of our effort in the past. Um, well, and if you could give me some context about the specifics you're concerned about, that would help as well. Well, first of all, I'll yield to Mr. Loebsack. Thank you, Mr. McNerney. I, I, I really do appreciate the intent of this. You know, Mr. Walden, we talked last night, you found me on the floor and brought this, uh, your intention to my, or your amendment to my attention. And as you said, I was a strong supporter as the lead on the Small Business Broadband Deployment Act. So it, it is an important discussion to be had. There's no question about that. But I do have to agree with Mr. McNerney and I, I would hope that you could withdraw this amendment at this time. But I do wanna work with you, as we talked about last night in more detail, more depth, between now and the full markup. Uh, and, and I think we can get to a good point. I do believe that. And I think we can have a good discussion as we've had over the years since I've been on this committee. Uh, so I would like to move forward uh, and, and look at this. You and I have conversations, other have com others have conversations, discuss it between now and the full market if you'd be willing to withdraw it today. And I do appreciate your efforts, as you know, we've had well, lots Will of Mr. Discussion. McNerney yield? Yes, I'll yield. Yeah, I, I would just say to my friend, I, I, I think we can find some middle ground here. Uh, and if the gentleman would be willing to withdraw his amendment, you have my commitment uh, that we will work on this between now and, and the full committee markup uh, to see if we can get this in a position where we can all support it. Mr. Chairman, may I be recognized briefly? Uh, well, I, I don't have the time, but... Uh, McNerney, I, I, do you have the time? Who are, yeah. uh, Mr. McNerney, yes. I'll yield back to Mr. McNerney, who can yield to you. I'll yield to The gentleman yield for just, <laughs> just a few seconds. Let, let me just associate my, myself with Mr. McNerney, Mr. Lobsack, and, and even the chairman uh, to assure you, Mr. Walden, that I uh, will personally work with you. I, I agree with the four corners of your amendment. 
Uh, this certainly affects a municipal broadband service, yeah. an ISP in my hometown that serves less than 250,000 subscribers. And so I would pledge to you that I will personally work with yeah. you as well. Thank well, you. You're back. It, yeah. it, oh, the time's expired. May, uh, Mr. Ladd could be recognized and yield to me. Well, you're back. For what purpose does the gentleman uh, seek Yes, I'd like to strike the last word in support of the amendment. The gentleman's recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to yield to uh, our leader on the full, uh, the full committee, Mr. Walton. Well, thank you, Mr. Ladder, for yielding. And to, to my friends on, on both sides of the aisle, look, I think this is still really important, especially if you're going to put these burdens, from my perspective, burdensome rules on. Um, we did negotiate the number down last time at the uh, insistence of the, the minority at that time uh, to this level. Um, and so I'm, I'm open to entertaining further discussions, and uh, I know they are in good faith, uh, and I recognize the changed circumstances. Um, and so with that, I uh, would ask to withdraw the amendment. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman withdraws his amendment. Are there any other amendments? Wow. Okay, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 1644. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? No. Mr. Chairman, Gentlemen's uh, uh, I'd Mr. like to have the yeas and nays. Uh, the, the yeas and nays have been requested. A recorded vote is ordered. Those in favor of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. And the clerk will call the roll. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Lobsack. Mr. Lobsack votes aye. Mr. Vesey. Mr. Vesey votes aye. Mr. McEachin. <coughs> Mr. McEachin votes aye. Mr. Soto. Mr. Soto votes aye. Mr. O'Halloran. Mr. O'Halloran votes aye. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes aye. Ms. Ms. DeGette. Ms. DeGette votes aye. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes aye. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Lujan. Aye. Mr. Lujan votes aye. Mr. Schrader. Mr. Schrader votes aye. Mr. Cardenas. Aye. Mr. Cardenas votes aye. Mrs. Dingle. Aye. Mrs. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Aye. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes no. Mr. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Scalise. We'll wait. Mr. Olson. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Belarakis. Mr. Belarakis votes no. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Long. Mr. Long votes no. Mr. Flores. Mrs. Brooks. Mrs. Brooks votes no. Mr. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Wahlberg, I apologize. Mr. Mr. Wahlberg. But no, no. <laughs> Mr. Giafortes. Mr. Giafortes votes no. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden votes no. Mr. Shimkus. No. Mr. Shimkus votes no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes yes. Mr. Doyle votes aye.
Is that it? Is it just the... Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise votes no. Have all members voted? <laughs> Mr. Flores. Mr. Flores votes no. <laughs> okay. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Does any member wish to change his or her vote? If not, the clerk will report to tally. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, the ayes were 18 and the nays were 11. The vote is 18 ayes to 11 nays. H.R. 1644 is forwarded to the full committee. Without objection, the staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the bill consistent with the actions taken by the subcommittee on the bill today. Anything else? Okay, if that's it, the subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs>